Coming from Central Kentucky, land of horses, bourbon, and basketball, straight to your ears, ChickenCoopGuides.com presents AgriCast Digest, your place to get news and information about anything agriculturally related. Please welcome your host, Gabrielle Yoder. Hiya, folks. Thanks for joining us for this week's episode of AgriCast Digest. I hope you're having a good day wherever you are. And I thought I'd share with you the gleanings from the news I've read recently this week. Dr. Mercola published an an article on his website about the avian flu, and I know we've already talked about this a million times, Um, but his opinion is that the antibiotics that they use in the factory farms creates resistant superbugs. I think I even mentioned that directly last week or the week before, and I totally agree. He notes that they use the antibiotics as a preventative instead of a cure, which is even worse. So you've got really sick chickens being forced to lay in horrible conditions with artificial light to control their laying in an unnatural way. All of us backyard farmers should take note of this, especially in the wintertime when a lot of folks want to uh, use that artificial light to control the laying themselves. Now, he does know that there are 23,000 deaths a year from antibiotic-resistant microbes. And how many of those are being exacerbated by the antibiotics folks are eating in their chicken and beef? Uh, The antibiotics that people are flushing down their toilets also gets into the water supply. There's runoff from factory farms. This is really something to think about. Um, a really good water filter, um, not a Brita, <laughs> a water filter uh, would be helpful. Uh, it's not going to get everything out, but it usually helps. Um, there's a lot of ones on the market. Some people do the reverse osmosis thing. Uh, they do the whole thing through their house, and that's cool. Um, we have a Berkey, a British Berkfeld. I'm not promote. I'm not like selling them or anything, but we love it personally. We've had it for years, and it lasts for years. That's one I know personally uh, works really well. Now, um, Mercola did mention that food producers use chlorine baths, irradiation, and pasteurization to fix our food and make it supposedly cleaner. So, if this is the case, how then do over nine million people get sick from foodborne illnesses every year? It can't all be from improperly handled food on the consumer end. I'd say perhaps a quarter can be attributed to that from my own experiences working in kitchens when I was younger. I think most of it comes from the factory side. (laughs) I mean, I don't want to gross anybody out here, but I remember back in Florida watching the migrant workers pull their pants down and hose their strawberries because they didn't feel like running to the portage on. Or they do worse right there on the plants. And sure, okay, I suppose that's probably something our ancestors did, but ew. I mean, that's literally crappy where you eat. Almost every year, there were high instances of people getting sick from hepatitis and whatever else these, you know, folks had from people who attended the strawberry festival. Um, Or people would get sick eating spinach. You shouldn't get sick eating spinach. You shouldn't be able to catch hepatitis from a strawberry. You also shouldn't have to lay eat eggs laid by sick chickens or eat a drumstick that's full of antibiotics. It messes with your gut flora, which is one of a myriad of reasons why I think people today are getting sicker and sicker. Um, but there's ways to fix it. You know, you, it's not all doom and gloom. Um, it's something that's really easy to fix. You just have to make sure you wash your vegetables, organic or otherwise, very well. Um, baking soda water is so easy to use. You just fill the sink up with water. You put your baking soda in. You put your vegetables in. It gets off most of what's in there. Um, or vinegar and water. But I use baking soda and water. Works really well. You wash all your veggies. You make sure, you know, because as long as you wash them, you're getting everything off. So all that nasty junk that might be on there, it's coming off. Um as far as the antibiotics goes and our water and our food, that's a little more difficult. Um, I mean, really just raising it yourself and eating it yourself is probably the easiest way. The second easiest is probably to get it from someone uh, nearby, a local farmer. Um, that's why I really support local sustained agriculture, especially here in Kentucky. They've got the ash free on um, everything. Everybody's like ash free, ash free. And everyone's like, what's ash free? And, Ash free is uh, antibiotic, steroid, and hormone free. So look for that on a label. Um, and but speaking of vegetables, I was talking about vegetables a minute ago. The other article I was reading came from the Healthy Home Economist, and um, she highlights the growing trend to make quick organics by growing the vegetables and fruits hydroponically. 
Uh, so I guess there's no chance of someone peeing on your strawberries that way, Lisa. Um, doesn't mean necessarily that the water was that clean, but, uh, I mean, I still say you should wash it one way or another, but, uh, yeah. So I have to agree with her sentiments. I'm, I'm not a fan of, sometimes she's a little hard to swallow with her stuff. It's, it's, she comes off a little bit abrasive, I guess. Um, but most of the time I agree with her, I'd say about 85 to 90%. Um, I'm not a fan of hydroponic vegetables. She really hit it on the ball, on the ball here. Um, they are very low in nutrients and I'll throw some facts at you folks. Did you know that most produce has between about five to 40% less nutrients than the same produce did back in 1950? There's a number of factors to consider like different breeds. They've grown, um, different breeds that, uh, are more prolific versus breeds that are more nutritious. Um, But the biggest factor we really need to take into consideration is that we've taken so much out of our soil and we've put so little back into it. In fact, there's a fellow who specializes in this that I'm trying to get on the show, but I'll update y'all more about that later. Um, Now, I noticed a long time ago, when we first started eating organic vegetables about 10 years ago, that there was a really big difference in taste between organic and non-organic vegetables. Collard greens was really where I noticed it first. They weren't bitter. Now, we're Southern. I'm Southern, at least. Um, My husband has Yankee parents, so I don't count him, but (laughs) um, we ate a lot of collard greens growing up. And we always had to put sugar or bacon. My grandmother, she always tossed a carrot in there and she said it soaked up the bitterness. Um, But these collard greens were naturally sweet. I could and I did eat them raw. We used them for wrapping up sandwiches. Um, And it it worked great. And I really grew curious about why this was. And I figured it was just that the lack of pesticides um, made it not bitter. I I thought less residue. But I'm pretty sure I was wrong. And we found out later that I probably was wrong. Um, It's the whole way that the plant is grown. The soil is amended to add nutrients. And the reason why that those collard greens that I ate that were organic, they came, I think, from Lady Moon Farms. I think I still buy the same ones today. Um, But the reason those collard greens did not taste bitter versus the ones that were grown even locally in, you know, bad conditions down in Florida. The reason why there were a diff- was a difference was the bricks levels. And I'll go into more about that in a second. Now, so when my husband and I first started our garden, our very first garden, very first house, we wanted to do it right. And I researched and I researched and I researched until I found an article on the Weston A. Price Foundation website about bricks levels. Now, plants that have a naturally high bricks or sugar level will not only taste sweeter, but they are more nutritious and they are naturally healthy. The plants are healthy to the point that they repel insects all on their own. And I remember Googling about how to raise the bricks levels. And back then I could only find articles from potheads. Um, Apparently they like their crops to be sweet too. Uh, Now, it's a lot easier to find information now, but back then we kind of had to sort of wing it. So I took the article that I read about the bricks and I tried to deconstruct it as much as possible and took all of the information I could out of it. And we took that heavy Kentucky clay that we had to start with, which was wonderfully rich. And we amended it with topsoil and we put compost in the form of aged horse manure and we added bone, blood and kelp meal to it. And we kind of mixed all of this up and we tacked it all down with plastic to let it all marinate while it was still winter time. And then the first thing in the spring, we ripped off the plastic. We probably should have left it on if we were smart and it would have controlled weeds better. But um, we started planting. Now, we'd occasionally foliar feed the growing vegetables. Foliar feeding is basically like a spray on fertilizer, if you will. So if you've never foliar fed, I definitely recommend it. But we didn't do it religiously. We only did it when we remembered to do it. So maybe once or twice a month. Um, Maybe a total of four times in the whole growing season. Um, The only bug problems we really had were squash beetles. Um, But a healthy dose of wood ashes also got rid of them right away. So they went right away. We had zucchini that were the size of baseball bats, and they were still tender. And the sweet potatoes were almost shooting out of the ground, and they grew about as big as our heads. 
the plenty we had that year was amazing. And the years after, too, because we continued to amend the soil and to foliar feed. Um, the weeds drove us insane. So I heartily recommend using black plastic and mulch as a way to control those. Um, or you can eat them. Uh, but we could really only eat so many lambs, quarters, and dandelions. And eventually we figured out how to keep the weeds under control without having to resort to herbicides. Um, now, I want you to think for a minute, folks, about the difference between the junky, watery tomatoes you get in the supermarket and the fat, red, juicy tomatoes you can get at the farmer's market. Most farmer's markets, anyway. Some of them I found, they go down to Florida and Georgia and they buy a bunch of junk and they haul it back to wherever and it's green. And then, you know, by the time they get wherever they, they're going, it's red. Um, you really need to get the stuff grown right nearby. There's like giant striped Germans and green zebras and purple Cherokees, you know, the ones that have the really cool names, the good ones. Eat one of those and then try eating some of the junk at the supermarket. There's just no comparison. It doesn't have to be labeled organic, but you want something that's been organically grown. In fact, I found the best stuff is the stuff that's been grown organically, but can't be labeled yet because they haven't hit that five or seven or however many years it is that they have to be um, certified as organically growing it. So you really get it cheaper that way, but it's the same nutrient value or better as organic. So you might look for that as well as in your meats if you don't, you know, grow your own cows on your own backyard or whatever. Uh, now, that doesn't mean just pesticides. It does mean that they have given the soil back something in order to get a good return themselves, and it pays off big time. There's a lot of different ways to do it. Some people say you should till it in. Some people say don't till anything at all because it messes up the microbiome or whatever. And I'm of two minds of it because I haven't done enough research on that. Um, one of the people I'm trying to get in on the show is actually a woman who specializes in permaculture. So we're going to see if we can hear from her sometime soon. Um, now, there was a ridiculous study done a couple of years ago that tried to say that there was no nutritional difference between organics and conventional produce. And there's a lot of studies out there. You could get a study to say pretty much anything you want to if you grease the right palms. So if you're looking at those organic hydroponic tomatoes versus conventional hothouse tomatoes, then they're probably the exact same nutrient profile. And that study was probably correct if that's what they were looking at. It really all comes down to the way it's been grown, which doesn't mean necessarily an organic label. This makes it harder for us as the consumer to find that pearl of truth in the pig pen. Um, for what we don't grow ourselves, I always make a point to buy the Dirty Dozen organically. One thing a lot of people don't know is that the Dirty Dozen changes every year, so you have to keep on top of what's going on and not just assume that because apples are dirty now, that they'll be dirty next year. Um, I buy the Dirty Dozen organically, and the Clean 15 I will buy conventionally. Sometimes the selection is so small that I just buy what's available, period, and I wash it really well, or I prefer to get stuff that can be peeled. Um, and by the way, before I go to the Q&A section, I thought I'd mention that we got a comment from a listener who described me as sounding like this. Let him bring it alone! Please! It gave me a real chuckle. I hope I don't sound like that. I'm just passionate about this stuff. I felt like my blinders fell off around 2006. And since then, I really see a whole different world. And I want other people to see it too. I don't want it to be all negative all the time. But sometimes you need a shock to get your head out of the sand. And I know that that's what it what did it for us. So right now, I want to go to the Q&A for today. Now, Hans Schmelzer, that is a fabulous name. That is such a cool name. Hans Schmelzer. He wrote to us because he read somewhere that chickens have been bred purely for looks and not to lay eggs. Um, he mentions the silver laced Wyandotte and asked if it's true if they don't lay eggs at all. I love the internet. You get some of the best stuff. And it's true that some chickens are bred more for their looks or for their feathers, especially think of Yokohamas when I think of ornamental breeds. Um, but all chickens, you know, the Yokohamas, by the way, are those ones that have the really long tail feathers. They look like they drag them along the ground. They're real prima donnas. They're a pain in the butt to deal with. Um, <laughs> but they're or an ornamental breed. Um, but all chickens, being birds, they do lay eggs. It's just that some breeds lay more prolifically than others. The silver lace Wyandotte, by the way, they're actually known as a really good dependable layer. They average about 200 brown eggs a year. 
Um, some of the other breeds known to be poor layers are Arcanas, which I've had some of those. They're they're really sweet, at least the ones we've had. Um, Buttercups, Cutchins, Cornish, Dorking, Hamburg, Lockenvelders, Orloff, Seabrights. You could check out Henderson's Chicken Chart. It was created by a professor, prof, professor, <laughs> a professor at Ithaca, um, which rates the laying production of most breeds. Now, don't forget other factors that will cause your egg production to vary, like the day length. We talked about that earlier with uh, keeping the lights on 24 hours. Um, the age and the health of your flock, disease, their diet, that's all going to affect their egg production too. Um, next question comes from Michelle. And this is another awesome <laughs> question. I love these. I have a chicken who is laying shellless eggs. I make sure that they have oyster shell in the proper lay crumble and various scraps, leafy greens, watermelon, and fruit stuff. Are there nutrient are there nutrients that I should be adding to their diet? Thank you. Power to the chicken. <laughs> First, you're awesome, Michelle. Power to the chicken indeed. I love it. Um, as for your egg problem, part of it could be from a layer who is too young or too old, which I covered in a previous broadcast. But let me dig a deeper for a moment. You are correct, Michelle, in pointing out that you offered ground oyster shell. Chickens need calcium to produce eggshells, and feeding oyster shell is one of the best ways to, ways to provide that. It doesn't spoil, it's inexpensive, it's easily absorbed, and it's palatable to the birds. But make sure you're feeding it separately as a free choice, not mixed in with their feed. I do, I will admit, I will sometimes just toss it in with their feed, especially um, in the spring or fall when I know that the weather's fine and they're probably going to eat all of their food. Um, But if your birds are eating less because of hot weather or because of the too many treats, they're going to get less calcium if the egg oyster shell is mixed in with the feed. And some hens just need more calcium than others. Put it in a dish by your feeders and let them help themselves. They'll eat what they need. And it's it's your choice, but this is what we do. Um, another thing that can cause shellless eggs is too much salt in your water. Something else you may want to check out. Um, but this is the if this is the only hen that's having the problems, then you can pretty much rule those out as causes. It's not unusual for older hens or hens that are just starting to lay um, after a period of non-laying, it can take some time for them to restart their internal system. Stress can be a possible cause for this too, um, but that would be a temporary thing. And the last thing to consider is disease. I mean, I'm assuming, of course, that you've already thought about if they're too young, too old, and what have you. Um, there are certain diseases that can affect the oviduct function, such as infectious bronchitis, mycoplasma, uh, galliseptism, uh, or it's egg, called egg drop syndrome, EDS for short, that will result in shellless eggs. EDS um, causes apparently healthy birds to lay sh- soft-shelled and shellless eggs, and it's frequently at times of peak, peak production. So it's caused by an adenovirus that is widely distributed in wild and domestic geese and ducks. So if you remember how we talked about trying to keep wild birds separate from the birds you have domesticated, um, that's another reason why um, free range birds are going to be most at risk for that for obvious reasons um, layers of brown eggs for some reason are more prone to it than those white shell white shell egg layers all eggs can be affected though the first the first symptoms you want to look for are usually weak shell egg shells um, a loss of shell pigmentation then you're going to get start getting the thin soft and shellless eggs um, most effect, infected birds kind of appear depressed and droopy for about 48 hours, and you really wouldn't notice any other change in their health, but the bird suffers very little. Um, EDS does cause a reduction in laying, but a lot of times you won't even notice this because hens often eat thin-shelled or the shellless eggs. Um, eventually, the bird recovers, but will still occasionally produce shellless eggs from the previous infection. There's really no cure for this. Um, you just kind of have to deal with it. Now, um, that's all I've got for today, folks. I'm really asking you to please send in new questions for us, especially really funny ones like those. I love the little sayings and phrases at the end or the really cool names. If you want to make up a name and send it to me, go ahead. I just love that stuff. Um, but no one can get a better name than Hans Schmelzer. That's that's awesome. Um, 
But um, anyway, just go to the podcast main page, um, send in questions. Um, if there's any, if ever have any uh, links or fun stuff, I'll put it on that page as well for each episode. Um, again, folks, I wanted to tell you thanks for listening. Uh, good night and God bless. You've been listening to AgriCast Digest. If you like what you just heard, please share with your friends. And don't forget to go to chickencoopguides.com slash podcast to download transcripts and archives of this episode, as well as take advantage of any freebies or trials offered in this episode. You can then visit our private podcast Facebook page, also linked there. This has been a Bluebird Media production.